Good morning, everyone. That's the little outline in hopes that it will make the structure of my talk a little bit clearer. So, uh, about three weeks ago, we had a wonderful retreat here at MABA, which I was privileged to attend. It was led by a um, Chan teacher, Guo Gu, who works in Tallahassee. And he was a student of Master, um, Venerable Master Sheng Yen, while well, he was a monastic. Um, the focus of the retreat was silent illumination meditation. And Guo Gu has written a book called The Essence of Chan, A Practical Guide to Life and Practice According to the Teachings of Bodhidharma. And in this book, Wogu translates and gives commentaries on Bodhidharma's text, which is called Two Entries and Four Practices. So it's a book about a book. And I'd like to try and share these teachings with you because the big message of Chan Buddhism, which Wogu emphasizes in his writings, and which he also um, brought out of the retreat, um, is that Chan is a practice that is founded on meditation, but which really requires that our practice penetrate every aspect of our lives, our work, and our relationships. So I'll begin with a little information about Bodhidharma, whose teachings we're going to focus on. He's known as the first patriarch of Chan, or Chinese Buddhism because it was he who brought what we now refer to as Chan, or Zen Buddhism, to China um, from India, or perhaps from P Persia, or even Afghanistan. It's not exactly clear where he came from. Um, Buddhism of Central Asia and India had originally come to China between the first century BCE and the first century CE, but it brought along with it um, a very diverse collection of texts. So it took a while for Chinese scholars to make sense of these. Bodhidharma arrived around 527 CE. And eventually news of his arrival came to the attention of Emperor Wu, who was already a great patron of Buddhism building monasteries, and sponsoring translation projects. So the emperor was very proud of his accomplishments, and he wanted to meet this learned monk who had arrived in his empire. So he sent for Bodhidharma to come to court. Bodhidharma complied, and he came dressed in a simple and perhaps none too clean robe, with an unkempt beard and bare feet. The emperor began bragging to Bodhidharma about all the works he had undertaken to promote Buddhism throughout his lands, and he asked Bodhidharma how much merit he had acquired through these works. Bodhidharma's answer shocked the emperor, because he replied, none whatsoever. Well, in the system of Buddhism which the emperor had learned the idea of accumulating merit for good deeds was very widely held, and that these good deeds would earn what we might call brownie points or merit badges for the practitioner, giving him more favorable karma. After Bodhidharma gave his answer, none whatsoever, the emperor challenged him with another question. He said, you're a Buddhist monk in Buddhist robes, yet you do not even know your own doctrine? Who are you? Who is this standing before me? And to this Bodhidharma replied, don't know. <coughs> so in this legend of the meeting between Bodhidharma and Emperor Wu are illustrated the first two key teachings of Bodhidharma and of Chan. <coughs> By saying that the emperor had earned no merit whatsoever, Bodhidharma was referring to the fact that our true nature is independent of merit. It cannot increase or decrease. 
because all things are interdependent and interconnected. Therefore, all deeds are empty, <coughs> not because they're void of meaning, but because nothing is fixed and separate. I can only perform good deeds through the generosity and help of other beings. Nothing I do is independently done. This erroneous idea of merit leads us to the teaching of the four emptinesses. To have merit assumes that there is someone performing the good deed, that there is someone else receiving the benefit, that there are sentient beings, and that there is an actual meritorious act. These four aspects, self, others, sentient beings, and the act itself, are called in Buddhism the four emptinesses, because none of them can or do exist on their own. But instead, each of them exists dependent on and in relation to all the others. The second teaching Bodhidharma gave the emperor with his answer, don't know, was meant to sweep away all the emperor's conceptualizations, the assumptions of you and I, the dualistic assumptions that separate and divide, that discriminate and label, ideas of time and space, of now and then, here and now, here and there, I should say. If the emperor's mind had been properly prepared, he would have seen through all the clutter and dualisms to the true nature of his mind, but he wasn't yet ready for that lesson. So now you know a little bit about the subject of Wohu's book and the first patriarch, patriarch of Chan uh, Buddhism, who's Bodhidharma. Wohu also gives some background to Bodhidharma's text by saying something about threefold study in Chan. All Buddhist teaching systems contain three categories, precepts, meditation, and wisdom. But he points out that there's a traditional way of cultivating the threefold study, and there's the Chan way. In the traditional way, first we practice the five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no false speech, and no intoxication. By following the precepts, we discipline ourselves with regard to our attachments and our cravings, we learn to see the difference between what we want and what we need, and we thereby rid ourselves of the source of our vexations and trouble. Precepts help us maintain harmony within ourselves and with others. We gain mastery over our mind, which becomes more focused and clear. This leads to improved capacity for concentration and meditation and less attachment to superficial sense objects in the external environment. The second category of threefold study is meditation. The purpose of meditation is to focus the mind when it is scattered. When this happens, the mind's inherent clarity shines forth, and this is called wisdom. Wisdom, which is the third category of study, means the ability to see the world as it actually is, interconnected and free of our projections based on our likes and dislikes, judgments and categories. We see that things are dynamic, unfixed, interdependent. This is also what we mean by emptiness, and our realization of this wisdom is called the wisdom of emptiness. This wisdom frees us from our suffering and its causes and unleashes our inherent compassion. So all that I've just described is the traditional way of threefold study. The Chan way, Wargu tells us, is somewhat different. Chan is called the sudden path because it aims directly at the realization of the nature of mind or who we are. Guogu explains that Chan practice of the threefold study is distinct because it simplifies 
much of the extraneous teachings and rituals of traditional Buddhism. Chan threefold study is not limited to specific acts, but is applicable to every moment of our lives. It also emphasizes practicing the three aspects of precepts, meditation, and wisdom simultaneously instead of sequentially. This is also the direct method taught in Bodhidharma's two entries and four practices, which I'm coming to. In order to practice the threefold study simultaneously, we need to deeply understand that all things are always changing, impermanent, and interconnected. Therefore, it's pointless to fixate on negativity when we encounter difficulties. Because what appears to me ne to be negative might turn out to bring much benefit. It might be a blessing in disguise. So when challenges come to us in life, we need to learn to adapt to the new situation, recognize how it's connected to other aspects of our life, and have no fixed idea about how to solve the challenge. Instead, we should remain fluid, open, and let solutions appear in their own time. In the Chan practice of meditation, there is no need to suppress thoughts, and also no need to follow them and be swayed by them. We see that thoughts liberate themselves when we are not attached to them. Chan teaches us to recognize the nature of mind so that we will no longer be troubled by our thoughts and mental chatter. If we remain with attachment or aversion to our thoughts and chatter, this keeps our mind from becoming clear and settled. So just to sum up the Chan approach, the simultaneous approach to threefold study, we practice precepts, meditation, and wisdom based on the recognition that all beings and things are interconnected and interdependent. I practice precepts throughout my life by wisely seeing the difference between what I want and what I need. I meditate without either attachment to or aversion from my thoughts and other mental factors. I can do this because I know that they arise and cease dependent on causes and conditions, and they have no intrinsic reality. I avoid leaving a narrative around thoughts and emotions, creating a sense of self, which only increases suffering. I also practice seeing that the true nature of my mind is mirror-like clarity, and this practice helps my meditation and my cultivation of the precepts. Now we come to Bodhidharma's text, beginning with entering the path through principle, the first entry. Bodhidharma teaches that there are two entries to the path, meaning the path to Buddhahood. Entry through principle and entry through practice. Generally, entry through the principle refers to the direct realization of Chan enlightenment. The teaching of entering through principle has four main dimensions. It means, first, that one awakens to the essence, meaning no self, by means of the teaching. Notice that Bodhidharma says, by means of the teaching. We shouldn't confuse the teaching with enlightenment, as the teaching is like a finger pointing to the moon. It's not the moon itself. Second, one has the profound conviction that all beings are identical in their true nature. True nature is impermanent and unfixed, interconnected and inseparable from other phenomena. We fail to see our true nature because we are bound by our views, our knowledge, our experience. We prefer to believe that we are autonomous, but we share exactly the same nature as other beings. An example that Wo Hu uses is Play-Doh. I don't know if they still make that toy that I used to mold with as a child. 
You can shape Plato into all kinds of shapes, anything you want, a person, a cow, a table. But the nature of Plato stays the same. This means that we can have peace of mind. There are no threats to our well-being because everything is connected and of the same nature. The third meaning of entering the path through principle is that it's only due to the covering of what is called adventitious dust and deluded thinking that this true nature is not revealed. Adventitious dust is like dust that covers a mirror. It's not part of the mirror, although it blocks the clarity of the mirror. And it's just so with our deluded thinking and vexations. The fourth aspect is, if one relinquishes delusion and returns to the true, in Bodhidharma's words, I quote, abides in stillness and engages in wall-like contemplation <clears throat> where the self and other are absent, and the ordinary and the holy are equal, then, without any wavering whatsoever, <clears throat> and without chasing after the written teachings, one is in sublime accordance with the principle. This is the state free from discrimination, in utter quiescence and without any effort. This is called entrance by principle." End quote. This fourth aspect refers to equanimity. No self and no other, no difference between ordinary and holy. It doesn't mean withdrawal from the world or becoming dumb to our senses and knowledge. But we're not caught up with ourselves. Gogu explains that selflessness in Buddhism is founded on a healthy, mentally stable sense of self. Our practice then slowly matures the self spiritually. In the process of spiritual maturation, we come to realize no self. In order to mature spiritually, it's helpful to have various practices that help us to recognize the true nature of our mind and lead happier lives. And toward this end, Bodhidharma presents the four practices, which I will turn to next. Bodhidharma divides practice into four categories. Embracing retribution, <clears throat> adapting to conditions, non-seeking, and conforming to the Dharma. And I'll explain each one. <clears throat> These four practices give us a way to integrate the Dharma with our life our views, and they help us with understanding ourselves and others and to deal with challenges. We have to understand that practice cannot be limited to seated meditation, although that remains the foundation. This teaching emphasizes that only through a life of practice will we realize our full potential of enlightenment. So first, embracing retributions. This practice enables us to advance on the path through experiencing injustice. It's based on understanding karma. Bodhidharma writes, for innumerable eons, I have forsaken the root to follow the branches, wandering through various existences, giving rise to countless instances of ill will and hatred against others. Although today I do no wrong, I am reaping the fruit of my past actions. Neither gods nor people can foresee when the ripening of karmic fruit may occur. I accept this with an open heart and without ill will or complaint. So when we can understand that present causes and conditions are the result of my past karma, even though I may feel that I don't deserve the injustice in the present, I accept that at some point in the past, my actions and intentions brought about the present result. If we think about it, this practice helps us to take life less personally, to discount our own likes and dislikes. We're able to see difficulties, even injustice, 
as an opportunity for growth. Also, if we look closely and honestly at ourselves, we will see how deeply our habits of attachment and aversion rule all our actions, regenerating karma constantly. This habit energy strengthens our inflated idea of myself. This is the reason Chan teachings recommend the practice of re repentance prostrations as a wonderful way to alleviate our karma. It's a method to humble and cultivate the mind. In order to transform difficult situations into opportunities for practice, Guo Gu recommends the following four steps. First, to have an open heart, to face whatever we are experiencing rather than react in our usual way. Second, to accept the situation as the ripening of past karma. When we accept things, we will be able to discover solutions and respond with compassion and wisdom. Third, resolve and respond to the situation. We can only respond and find a solution after we fully accept the situation and its karmic roots. And fourth, after we have responded to the situation, we let it go. This means we let it pass without either praising ourselves for the way we solved it or beating ourselves up for failing. So we face it, accept it, resolve or respond, and then let it go. The second entry to the path through practice is what Bodhidharma calls adapting to conditions. This practice expands on the first, teaching us to accept all conditions, good and bad, as the result of causes and conditions, and to take my likes and dislikes, my self-reference, out of the equation. Everything good that happens to me is the result not just of my own efforts, but is dependent on the support of many people and things. The conditions that push and pull us in life are called in Buddhism the eight winds. These are pairs, gain and loss, fame and defamation, praise and ridicule, joy and sorrow. We are constantly under their influence, and our attachment to them causes the roller coaster of our emotional life. To truly understand the workings of causes and conditions, we have to let go. We can practice gratitude for the benefits in our life, but we don't attach to being a grateful person. In everything that happens, we recognize that conditions will change and that this situation will pass into something other. When we let go of our attachment to things, we let go of the self. Non-seeking is the third entry to the path through practice. Bodhidharma's text reads, people of this world are often deluded. To covet after this and that is what is meant by seeking. The wise awaken to the truth, pacifying their minds effortlessly. They wish for nothing and delight in neither merit nor darkness which always follow one another. Guo Gu points out that in our everyday existence, we're always seeking after something, whether it's material, such as youth, beauty, wealth, or spiritual things, such as enlightenment, mental bliss, or happiness. A certain amount of seeking is necessary, but this text is referring to excessive seeking due to misunderstanding reality. Buddhist and Chan practitioners do seek, but their seeking is motivated by what will lead to liberation rather than to more suffering. Guo Bu points out that even meditation can be either correct or incorrect seeking. For example, some people practice because they think they're great practitioners. Others practice to gain better health, find peace, 
improve their co complexion, learn to relax, become more useful or more successful. He even says that in Japan and Taiwan, some corporations send their employees to monasteries for training so that they can function more efficiently. So those are several examples of incorrect seeking on the spiritual path. Instead, once we are on the path and practicing Chan, we need to forget anything about any benefits that we might receive. We just practice for the sake of practice. This is practice based on non-seeking. Guogu offers the advice to, recognizes, to recognize what causes us to seek and why do we suffer when we seek. He says the principle to remember is to know what is proper seeking and what is not. We have to distinguish first what we want from what we need and second what we should have from what we could have. Finally, the practice of non-seeking tells us that fundamentally, we don't lack anything. The practice helps us to realize that. The fourth and final entry to the path through practice is called conforming to the Dharma. Bodhidharma says that Dharma here means to perceive that our nature is intrinsically pure. Even ideas of sentient being and self are impurities. He's, he says the essence of dharma is without possessiveness. Thus, one can give up life and wealth and practice generosity. Since one's mind is free of miserliness, one will comprehend the three emptinesses. You recall that these emptinesses are of self, emptiness of other, and emptiness of action. One depends on nothing and attaches to nothing. When you give in this spirit, he goes on, the other five paramitas follow suit. In order to eliminate delusion, practice the six paramitas and yet nothing is practiced. This is the practice of conforming to the Dharma. So because we are interconnected with all beings and everything else, we are in perfect accordance with the Dharma. Each phenomenon is made up of all other phenomena. I can't claim anything is me or mine because these concepts come from everything and everyone else. So we can freely give ourself. Bodhidharma also refers to the other five paramitas, which follow suit when one practices generosity. The six paramitas, or great perfections, as they're called, are generosity, patience, morality, diligence, meditation, and wisdom. They are the practices of a bodhisattva and are founded on emptiness. When we see and realize our interconnectedness and lack of self, we don't discriminate between self and other, and we give and give up our attachments. This is generosity, and the other five paramitas follow suit. It's so important not to attach to appearances, <coughs> to our own view of the world. We have to remember that things may not be what we think they are, if we can generously allow others to be, new possibilities of experiencing will be open to us. And remember that emptiness does not mean nothingness. Emptiness is relationships, which means there is no separation between self and other. When we help others, we help ourselves. So, to conclude, I'd like to recommend this book to you, which contains many clear and helpful teachings, much more clear than my little summary has done, I'm sure. It teaches that meditation is the foundation of self-transformation, but that we have to integrate every aspect of our life uh, as meditation. And we can learn in meditation not to, caught up, to get caught up with our ideas and thoughts, with grasping and rejecting, and this practice helps us not to get caught up with the eight winds in our daily life. 
And may we all cultivate the wisdom of emptiness and never lose sight of our intrinsic nature that is always free. May all beings enjoy with wisdom, happiness, and well-being.